across from the clinic. It is the oldest extant church uh, in Rochester, Minnesota, church building. Um, not the oldest congregation, actually. The First Baptist but is the oldest uh, organized group of Christians in Rochester, Minnesota. And remember, they used to have the church that is now where community medicine is. And they used to have a neon Jesus saves sign there as well. And, uh, and that was the old, that's the oldest congregation uh, in Rochester. But our church is the oldest standing building, and, and we, uh, we're, we're pleased to be that. And uh, it's exciting to be right down there in the middle of all that, I'll tell you. Uh, and it, it's, it happens to fit me, too, because my personality is such that if I were in a church way out on the edge of the suburb somewhere on the, on the, in a quiet, nice little neighborhood, I'd probably go crazy. Um, I, I like being in the flow and the action, and uh, certainly in the middle of Rochester, there's a lot of flow and action. It's great, great to be around all of that. Um, that. The church was actually founded in 1860. The building, that, it, that or the, the main part of the building, the nave, uh, the, uh, had a cornerstone set in 1862. And so, so it's the, the main part of the church, the worship space, has been pretty much as it is uh, today, since 1862. The ceiling, that's a wood ceiling in there, was added uh, later on in, in the 20s. And there were some other subtle adjustments made to the inside of, the, of that space, but for the most part, that's how it's been. And I'm the 17th rector there in Episcopal speak. Uh, uh, but <laughs> rector is the pastor, and it's, uh, it's actually kind of, a, kind of a, 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 a reduction of the concept of spiritual director. So I ended up just calling the priest the rector of the place, and in monasteries also the the uh, the head monk is called the rector sometimes. Uh, same oh. idea, the person that, that tries to offer some direction, which usually scares me when I start to think about it. But uh, but for the most part, uh, try to try to make it through. Thanksgiving is is a is a wonderful American tradition, and uh, as, I, as I understand it, I, I don't think it was actually started as a as a holiday until until 1776 thereafter. Uh, I mean, actually officially made a holiday. Of course, there was a first Thanksgiving, and I looked this up the other day, but there was a first Thanksgiving we all relate to, and it, and it was, uh, actually, I think there were there were 90 Native Americans that were invited to that gathering, and uh, and the Puritans were, were interested in giving thanks in, in a spiritual way. The feast kind of followed all of that, and uh, and the, those, the Native Americans brought, I don't know whether they brought a 20 deer, you know, with them, and on the fire, and and uh, and they went out, and uh, the Puritans went out and gathered up uh, birds, which probably were turkeys, and, and brought them to the feast uh, unstuffed. They didn't stuff their birds. But uh, and all that's wonderful. But I'm Italian. I don't know. This. <laughs> I, I, I don't know about all these things. And I mean, Thanksgiving's nice, but uh, I happen to come from a, a family that uh, that, uh, that I mean, everybody but my mom was born in Italy. And so, uh, so we came to America, and of course, as was the case in lots of those the, the ethnic uh, um, arrivals in, in this country, they 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 really made made haste to to Americanize themselves. To, they're not dressed like Americans dressed, whatever that meant, and and to to learn to eat how Americans eat, to observe these American holidays, and to get into the swing of this. So I mean, I for us, if you've ever been to an Italian Sunday afternoon lunch. It's like Thanksgiving every Sunday afternoon. after school. You know, I used to come home. I used to go home for lunch. Did you come home for lunch? Yeah. I used to come home for lunch in elementary school. We'd run down the street home for lunch, and my mom was she stayed home, never drove, and and I don't think ever left our kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> she was down. She actually I remember in the living room a couple times. But she, but but, uh, but I mean she was, and I'd come home for lunch, and she'd have a nice little Italian lunch there waiting for me. You know, a bowl of soup, a sandwich, a chicken. Pizza, <laughs> pie, a cake, all that she'd made in the, in the last two hours, and, uh, and just absolutely incredible. She was, she was great. But, but it was, I mean, feasts were big for us, and, uh, and so, so we, we tried to acclimate and learn about these American feasts. And with you, um, it's, a, it's a, a great celebration of Thanksgiving. And, and I don't know about you, but when I think of Thanksgiving, yeah, I think of turkey and stuff, but as I grow up and grow older, Think more of the of the bigger stuff, and and not to not not hopefully not in a romantic way, but I think about I think about what, what we really have to be thankful for, um, and and of course first comes to mind is family and friends, people that really go the distance. You know, as as we grow up to in, in this life experience, 
the, the list of things, of things that, that are really the, the vital things it shortens almost every couple of years. It gets shorter and shorter until finally you come to realize that there's a very short list of insoluble values, things that we know are true forever, things that we hold the dearest in our hearts that are, that are just there forever. And, and of course, on, on that list are, are the kinds of things that, that we, I, at least I believe, give thanks for. And uh, first on my list is my family and my friends, people that I can be myself with, uh, people that I can love and give to from, from the bottom of my heart. And, uh, and, and that's, that's enormously important. And, and when, I, when I give thanks, when I think about being thankful, those are the things that, that uh, like you, are way up there at the top of the list. But I'm also thankful for air. I have friends that come here from Chicago or, or New York, and they, you know, they, they pull into my driveway, they walk out in the backyard, and they go, "Oh my, this is just you have killed." And I, I think, <laughs> but, but you know, you know the feeling. I mean, we're, we're lucky here. We got air, fresh air, and and I think of and I think of other natural resources that we just take for granted. Water. I think about water a lot the quality of water, and I think about going to my sink and just turning it on, getting a glass of water, and then I, and every time, lately, I stop and think about those places around the world where, I mean, that's just, that doesn't happen. We have faucets. It's a, it's a, it's an American, uh, 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 it's a, a dream for people in other parts of the world. And it's right, my, I've got five of them, and I get a drink, and I just look at that water, and I don't have to think about that water, um, really. I just drink it down, and I put it in the coffee pot, and make some coffee. Don't even think twice. I put it in the soup. Don't even think twice. Water, air, and then, on the t uh, uh, in addition to, to those things, I can see. Do you, you ever stop and think about sight? How, I mean, you look at that, my favorite thing in the whole building, I've seen just the slide board. <laughs> and I mean, you, you, you came around that corner, you look up, and if you ever took high school math, you know that's a slide room. How does that, the, the way the light hits that piece of wood with those little markings on it, how does the light somehow find its way into my eye and do with it whatever that magic is in there that sends an impulse to my brain? The brain says, slide rule, dummy. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's a slide rule? Hey, just think about it. Every, every time you look around, you see something. Glass, light, window, door, person, picture, ice cream can. Bang. I can see. I can hear things um, from from the voice of my voices of my children to those things that I need to hear that keep me safe to those wonderful sounds that take me to another place when I walk out of the woods and I and I'm and I'm awed by by the symphony in the woods and music hearing music and and the, and the ability that music has to go beyond words into the depths of our souls. But when I think of Thanksgiving, I don't just think of the turkey, because I love the turkey. Don't get me wrong. And I love mashed potatoes, as a matter of fact. But I, I think of these things. Family, the gifts of this land that are, that are not, and not the complicated things. Not our governmental system, necessarily. That's a whole other talk. But, but, I, <laughs> but no, I mean, and even that, you know, I mean, we, we moan and complain and we got these different things going on, people running and what's going on. And, but, but, you know, actually, um, this experiment um, it beats any other one going on right now in the whole wide world. This experiment will take a proceed. Uh, short lived as it is, and we don't know where it's going at this point. Um, but in these, these trying and frightening times, um, we, we see it as one of our strengths and something to be thankful for. So, so I, I think I think of, of lots of things, and, and I think of, of particular stories on top of it all that make me thankful to, to be where I am. For example, did you see the thing? After, did you see the guy interviewed on the Today Show, who drove his truck up to block the uh, the escape of the snipers? I listened to that interview, and I just had it just knocked me out. This guy, you know, I would call, if you don't mind the stereotype, kind of a typical Midwestern, you know, guy in his, in his late 50s, early 60s. And he's the one who drove his truck up at that rest area where these snipers were sleeping in their car, supposedly. And he's kept his truck there, recognized the license on the car, 
and saw the two guys in the car, calls 911 and waits 15 minutes. Which would be a scary 15 minutes for, for the, the response from the, the police and the FBI, and of course they came en masse. And, um, and so they're interviewing this guy on the Today Show the next day. And he's just, you know, he's, he didn't, uh, he was just kind of sitting there and he's answering the questions. And, and Katie Couric says, well, you know, the person that actually did this, you know, caught these guys, gets a $500,000 reward. And, uh, and he said, oh, I knew that. I know that. She said, well, what do you, you know, did, have you thought about, you know, how you're going to do all this? And he said, yep. He said, my wife and me talked it over. And we decided that that's what any responsible American would have done. And I'd like that $500,000 to go to the families of the victims. We talked about it. Thank you for that spirit. Because I hope it's a spirit that's catchy amongst the young people and the people of this land. Uh, I'm thankful for that, for that kind of spirit, for that kind of, for that kind of authenticity and, and, and team spirit that, uh, that draws us together. I'm thankful for riding up 52. Did you ever go up 52 north to the cities? <laughs> <laughs> On the right, just by Pine Island, I look out my window and it's like a Hartford insurance commercial. There are elk there. <laughs> the big antlers. <laughs> First time I saw that, I just I said, "What is going on here? I can't believe this! Huge elk, right? And they weren't off, you know, scared. They're right by the fence, watching cars go by." Yeah. Here's a Buick. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> and and, uh, and and a land that uh, that is that underscores its its initiative and and, and taking on uh, th those kinds of things and, and developing the land and developing uh, um, the the, uh, the economy in a way that I don't think is bad but that uh, I think is exciting and says something about uh, what we have and what we need to be thankful for. So, so how do we keep Thanksgiving? How do we, how do we maintain the tradition that is the turkey and, and beyond the turkey? How do we maintain uh, the spirit of what we have, uh, what we are, and, uh, and uh, what we celebrate when we, when we come together? Well, I, I just have a couple of thoughts in that regard and then I'm going to be done. And that is that, um, that I think uh, we, insofar as time is, time is just, is just non-stop. And even as I speak here, these are, these are moments of our lives that are, we're not going to get back. You know, I always say, when you spend a day of your life, you're spending, you're not spending interest on the account, you're spending principal. Uh, and because, because, I mean, you only get so many days, and I don't know how many they are, and, and I, I don't happen to be a, a proponent of predestination, uh, but, but, you know, you just get so many days. And so, so we spend our lives, and, and our lives, insofar as time is just, it's just, <coughs> look at it, constantly. It's, it's just relentless. And, and that can psych you out or psych you up. And along with the, the relentless movement of time is, is the, uh, the ongoing evolution of change. And where I started out, it was, I mean, this place has changed. And, and, it's, and it's grown because of, because of uh, uh, loving care and, and, uh, and creative initiative and vision. But change is, change is all about us. And, and um, who was it I heard on, 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 or I read something the other day, the future isn't what it used to be. <laughs> you know, we used, we used to sit around our tables and think about the future. I, I grew up in a household like you with a dad who worked in the same corporation for 42 years. You know, it's the company he started with is the company he retired with. And, and they used to, you know, they'd say, his foreman would say to him every now and then, listen, if you, got, if you get a little, a little trouble there with the car thing, let me know, we'll help, we'll help take it out. If you have to take a few days off work, you just say the word, I'll, we'll take care of it, don't worry about it. It was that kind of thing. Um, and, we, and, and we grew up thinking that that's kind of what was out there, but it's not anymore. It's ch there's change all around us. And, and we can't be afraid of that change. Because, because it's, just, it's just where it is. I mean, change for change is, we all know it's ridiculous, but, but there's going to be change. And those of us who are willing to face that change and grow with change and look at it constructively with a yes instead of a no um, are, are, are the ones who get into the excitement of it and, and perhaps even make an investment in it. Because um, when I first came to that church, I got this is a true story. I come to that church. And um, our, the council of the church in, in Episcopal is called the vestry. So we have a vestry. And I get to this church, and I look out in the garden. You know there's a little garden, little green space out by that church? And I, I look out there, and there are three tulips 
over in a little corner, and a privet hedge all the way around the, the courtyard that said, stay out. So I looked at that and I get this idea. I thought, hey, we could make a garden out there. We could make flowers and stuff, and the congregation could plant them, and we could take down the hedge, and people will come in, and we could have live music and jugglers and fun out there. Wouldn't it be great? And so I get all pumped up, and I talk to another member of the congregation, and that, he, he got pumped up too. He drew up this plan. I took it to the vestry, and the, vest, the vestry looked at it and said, oh, no, you, you, <laughs> you can't do that. No, no, you can't do that. I said, why? I mean, it's, uh, picture this. And then, no, no. First of all, that privet head was given by Mrs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to mention her name because her picture's up in here in this building. But, and and if, you, if you take down that head, Mrs. Uh -huh is going to go off the wall. So, as I said, I'm Italian. And so, so I decided I'd go visit Mrs. Uh -huh. And so I took the plan, I, I made an appointment, I went to see, see this woman, and, and, um, who was a woman of, of, of means and a long reputation, and I went to her apartment, she was in a wheelchair, and, uh, and I went and we had some prayers, as a matter of fact, did some other sacramental things, and, and, I, and I had this plan, and I rolled it out on the table, I said, picture this. I said, this, we're going to go out like this, and, and all this will be great, and I said, the first thing we have to do, however, is take down that privet head. And I know you gave it 30 years ago as a memorial, but it says stay out. So she rolled her wheelchair up to the table, she looked at the plans, never looked up. She turned it over a couple of times, and without even looking up, she said, You know, I never liked that damn hedge anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Next day, I had a bulldozer out there. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, and the possibilities have, have increased, and it's been it's been a good thing. You know, sometimes we get we, we like the solid, the tried, the true, the tested. It's just a comfort zone for us. But if we can if we can somehow find our way beyond that uh, to to the possibilities that await, it really gets exciting. Because I'll tell you this: that now is we call it the Oasis Garden. We have an Oasis Courtyard series. It's a downtown institution. People come in and they just want to hear the music and they have their lunch, it's all free, the church provides it, they plant, the church plants the flowers, it's just, it's, it's worked in so many different ways that the excitement continues to grow. We can't fear change and say, no, -uh. we can't be that attitude that says, no way, we just don't do that. We've never done that before. I've never, you know, I, I just don't think, no, no, I, you know, you, you can try. We tried that five years ago. We had all that stuff. It takes, it takes some, some guts to make your way through that. It takes some fortitude to find your way through that. And I'm not implying that, that uh, I have that kind of uh, uh, staying power, but, but I, I'm suggesting we all have a little of it in us. And we, need to, we need to be able to follow through on that more and more. So I think to celebrate, to be thankful, and to allow the evolution of those kinds of good things to happen, we have to be ready to invest in that, in that kind of change in a positive way, to look into the vision and to find our way to it. Another thing that I think we need to do to magnify this, this sense of thanksgiving that we share yeah, it has to do with the front porch. Do you have a front porch? When I was a kid, when I was a kid, we used to sit out on the front porch on summer nights because the house was hot. My mom had a fan in the window, but it blew hot air in. <laughs> so we go out on the front porch. We had a steel swing. You know, one of these was a little. It, was a, you know, just, it wasn't a chain thing. It sat on the floor. A glider. We had a glider. And, and two folding chairs that we'd unfold, and we'd sit out there, you know, on those summer nights, and people would walk, this is Cleveland, Ohio. This is the city. People were walking down the street after dark. Walking down the street, hand in hand, you know. And they'd walk by our house, we'd be sitting out there on the glider, and my mom and dad, every time, would say, hey, Joe, Louise, come on up. How about some lemonade or something? We'll sit and talk. And we'd, they'd sit, they'd come up the front porch, we'd find some other chairs, and, we'd, and they would talk about profound things like lawnmowers, <laughs> tires, and how hot it was, you know? But they sat and they talked. And I, my friends, one of the things I think we're losing in our culture is that, that kind of dialogue. Sitting, people sitting together, just not, not, a, not a cocktail party necessarily, not an hors d'oeuvre contest, just sitting together, you know, and just saying, so what's going on with you? How are you doing? We've gone from the front porch to the back deck. <laughs> now we go to the back deck, we surround ourselves with an eight-foot fence and say, 
I hope no one can see us back here. <laughs> and what happens is we're isolating ourselves. Neighborhoods change when you isolate yourself. After 9-11, one of the things I suggested in, in, in various talks that I gave around town was that, that, um, that you, need to, you need to know your neighbors. It's time to get over and know those neighbors. If the people across the street are referred to in your house as the green car people, you better get over there and knock on the front door and ask their names and, and introduce yourself. It's time to do that. It's time for us to take the initiative to, to increase neighborhood again and the sense of neighborhood. You should know the people around you. You should be able to talk to them and invite them over. Not, again, not, not for something, uh, not for your Thanksgiving dinner necessarily, but for those small times in between where we have a chance to talk and just share life, <coughs> air things. We don't get a chance to air anymore. And I must say, as a sub-category sub, uh, uh, of that, especially men. Men don't get together and talk anymore. You try to find a men's group. Where, where men can get together and really talk. And, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that to, 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 to uh, magnify any, or any issues about men and women and stuff, but men, don't, they don't talk much to each other anymore. They're, they're, uh, they're few and far between. And so the mix is the best, uh, the best concept, obviously, men and women. But we need to talk. We need to be together and, and get back onto that front porch. And, um, and kids today, look out your neighborhoods. They're not out, I mean, rarely do you see kids out playing. Kids play anymore? Out in the street, you used to go out and hit the ball, and there was, they didn't have organized sports. Kids do stuff now. My wife teaches piano. You know what those things are? The kid comes, and the parents say, sorry we're late. We were just at Chinese class. So the kid comes now, and right after piano, they've got to go to, to, their, to their dance class, because they've got to get home, get their homework done, because they, they have a 4.30 in the morning ice time at the hockey rink, and they're, these kids are, I mean, they're, and the kids, are, you watch them, they're sort of going, Next thing, they don't give a rat's patootie. <laughs> the parent thinks it's important for the resume to put the kid through all these paces. And so what happens is the kids don't get a chance to stop and just play and do those creative things and and uh, and you know have you know find a pile of sticks and make a make a fort or whatever I mean, whatever you do with stuff like that. And, and kids need to play. Too many of them are, are either on the program or are down in the basement at the computer you know, in the dark. Sunny day outside, gorgeous. You know what our mothers would have said? Get out of here! Go! Don't come back until so ring the bell for supper. Get out! Don't even show your face. And and uh, and it was that it, it's that kind of playtime that, uh, that that I'm, I'm afraid we're missing as well. That's another issue of, of isolation and videos. And I mean the video business is huge. Look at all the video stores there are. I love watching videos. But I mean you watch families come in there on Friday night. And they, they rent eight videos. Eight times three is 24 hours. That's a lot of movie to watch in a weekend. You know? It's a lot of inside sitting there. As opposed to getting out, as opposed to, you know, I, Jesus himself said, rise, turn off your TV and talk. <laughs> <laughs> and it's important to do that. And I, and I, and I believe in that wholeheartedly. Finally, um, the, the, whole, the whole spirit of this, uh, I mean, really, at the heart of it, can't be quenched. And that is a, a spirit of thanksgiving. And, and, and that includes thanks and giving. And it's, it's, a, it's an enormously important spirit for us to magnify, to think a lot about Turkey and beyond in our lives. It's, and I'm going to finish with a wonderful story that, that, I, that I happen to love about a monk who was traveling through the forest. You know, he's all by himself walking through the forest on his journey. And he, see, he comes across a, a, a guy who's walking the other way. And the guy sees him and he says, hi. And the monk says, hi, young man, how are you? And then the guy, says, the guy says, well, I'm just, I don't know, I'm just wandering. And, and the monk says, why don't you sit with me, we'll have some lunch. And the monk opens his bag and there's some, some bread and some fruit and stuff in there. And there's a jewel in the bag. I mean, it's a jewel. It's a cut. It's as big as, it's huge. It is, it's incredible. And the guy sees this in the monk's bag and he says, whoa, what a jewel. And the monk says, oh, hey, here, have it. The guy said, what? Well, he couldn't possibly, I couldn't, there's no way. He was, he was a Minnesotan. <laughs> he says, I couldn't possibly, they're just, but the monk says, oh, go ahead, take it. It'll set you up for life. The guy goes, and so they have their lunch and they go their separate ways. About four hours later, the monk's walking along and he hears this guy's voice again. 
He looks around, there he is. The guy's running after him. He says, oh, monk, I'm glad I found you. And the monk says, what is it? Are you okay? And the guy said, I'm fine. He said, but here, I want you to have this back. And the monk said, no, keep it, no, no. And the guy said, no, no, I don't want the jewel. What I want is the spirit that allowed you to give it to me so freely. That's what I want. And that's what this thanks and giving is about, I think. Think on these things for me. Celebrate what we've got. Thanks for having me. Sure, if I, I, I'll, I'll respond to some questions that I'm not sure they'll be answered. <laughs> <laughs> well, since we're in the history of using them, yes. I thought maybe you might like to tell the folks a little bit about your history, where you came from, and how you got into your present vocation, and the different careers you went through, because I think it's a <coughs> well, I, 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 I'm flattered, and, and uh, thank you. I, I'm actually, I, I, grew, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and I uh, went to college in Ohio. I uh, met the, uh, the love of my life there at that college. You the and it was Heidelberg College, actually. My father went there. Really? <laughs> <laughs> the, Har the Harvard of the Midwest. <laughs> and uh, um, so went to Heidelberg College and, uh, and uh, got a job when I graduated teaching sixth grade, which is, which is really where I learned how to teach. Because I was trained as a teacher and I was married, actually, in college my senior year. My, my wife graduated a year ahead of me. And then did that for a year, got a job in a high school, teaching health and physical education and coaching, football and track, loved doing that. Did that for about seven years, actually. About halfway through that, uh, I got, uh, there's that, something in me was, was pointing me in the direction of, uh, of uh, priesthood. And I didn't really, uh, I never imagined uh, I would, that I would even approach something like that, but uh, uh, it started happening. Someone said to me, when were you really called to the priesthood? And I say to them, it was the summer I taught driver's ed. <laughs> <laughs> Which is true, but nobody believes it. So, so, uh, so, uh, so then, anyway, I started the process of discernment, went to seminary at uh, Colgate, Rochester, Bexley Hall, Crozer Divinity School in Rochester, New York. And I always say the whole name because it was a wonderful consortium of, that uh, combined um, Baptists, Episcopalians, Methodists, and Roman Catholics, as well as a few Presbyterians and two Jews. Uh, actually, that were, that were in the program. It was, it was a great program, and I, I am proud of it because uh, it's Colgate, Rochester, Bexley Hall, Crozer. Crozer Seminary is a seminary that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. attended down in Butler, Pennsylvania. And uh, like Bexley Hall, that was in Ohio, in Gambier, Ohio, uh, all these, these, uh, these seminaries came together in Rochester, New York. They brought their libraries, their faculties, everything together uh, to, uh, to make this wonderful, this wonderful uh, multi-denominational center. It's a great place to go. My theology professor was the same one that was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s theology professor. And so you can imagine how, how incredible that experience was. I was in, as a matter of fact, Dr. King's nephew's prayer group. Derek King was in my prayer group. Six of us sat together and uh, prayed together uh, for, for a couple of years. Anyways, um, graduated from the seminary and uh, uh, was ordained uh, to the diaconate. You've got to be a deacon in the Episcopal Church for six months before you can be considered for the priesthood. And they want to make sure you still want to do this. And then uh, was ordained to the priesthood. Got called to the church in Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, where, uh, where uh, we spent about three and a half years, during which uh, uh, we had a third child uh, who was born with multiple birth defects and, uh, and died. Uh, Three years into, excuse me, three weeks into her short life, uh, in my arms, um, and uh, then left uh, Kalamazoo and we went, went to Cedar Rapids, Iowa for two years. And after Cedar Rapids, Iowa, then up here to Rochester, um, where after being here about a year and a half, I was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer, and uh, that's really where we began to get to know, get to know one another. Uh, and, uh, and because we lived in Rochester, Minnesota, I built a real famous Mayo Clinic, and. Uh, diagnosed and treated here. Successfully. Successfully, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, we're, speaking of Thanksgiving, very thankful for that. Uh, so we've been here now 16 years and uh, two adult daughters. One adult, my eldest girl, is, uh, is uh, overdue on her first baby. By Saturday, her baby was due and we're still waiting. So if I leave suddenly, <laughs> that's why. Um, and my youngest child is a violinist and a master's in violin performance. 
and so she lives out in Denver, Colorado now and is teaching violin. So, uh, so my wife's a music teacher here in town and uh, she teaches elementary school music and private piano. First piano lesson is at 6.30 a.m. Before school. So, you know, and, and I, know, I know the kids by their songs. <laughs> you, know, you come out of the bedroom at 6.30 in the morning, you're going down the hall, and you know, there's some little kid going, Morning, Mr. Biz! <laughs> <laughs> you're using a Relco shaver. Wow, that's pretty good. <laughs> that kind of thing happens. Rick, would you care to comment on your acting career and what you're doing, what you haven't been doing, and maybe your radio career? Oh, well, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I, I do like to act as well. And, 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 uh, I even recognize the people in the room that are on stage together. But, uh, but um, acting and theatrical things are wonderful because they're team things. They remind you that, uh, that uh, you know, there's no Lone Ranger out there. And, and I really love theater in that regard because uh, here are these people that really don't know one another, suddenly thrown together to do a piece of art that will never be done the same way again. <laughs> because it's a unique group that's coming together. And you, you express this, the, the theme and the art of this particular written piece in a, in a way that, uh, that hopefully makes the point that it's intended. And, uh, and it's, it's really fun to do. I really enjoy doing that. And, uh, and, uh, and every time I uh, learn something new, uh, and, uh, and you, can, you can take that kind of attitude, I think it can be great fun. So I love doing that. And, uh, and then there's the, uh, there's a, a, a radio thing that uh, when I first um, got into the radio business, I don't know how much you all know about that, but uh, I, started, I started doing voices for the local radio. You know, I was, uh, I was at the world's only squirrel. I was various and sundry other characters around, around, uh, around the state of, uh, of Minnesota and, uh, and beyond. I was Dan Contraire. Uh, calling from New York City, I would always call up the radio station, be really mad and mean and sort of New Yorkish. And that was kind of fun. I did that for a while. I still do that from time to time. It depends on my mood. And I, uh, and, uh, and various, various other things, which is great fun. Uh, the world's oldest elf. I do that every Christmas. I've been Santa on the radio a couple of times. And I do an ongoing character that uh, it's kind of fun. Will remain unidentified. Well, I yes. Uh, let's just suffice it to, to not, say I, I, I know Uncle Norty very well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I go to the Greek Orthodox Church, but uh, I used to go to the Episcopal Church when we didn't have a church. And the pastor was the Reverend Menifee. You probably heard of him. I have. Uh, and, uh, I mean, uh, and he, he was not a minister at first either. I think he would have worked on the railroad until he was about 37 years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Time for the rest of the and the next year we have to do it again. So, uh, so we we, uh, we put a peak roof over at the north end of the building and added some floor space underneath basically another parish hall, reconfigured some other areas in the building, added uh, handicap accessibility with a ramp. The driver now waiting to buy an elevator because we're 
we're still raising funds for that. If anybody has an elevator card, they're not using. Yeah, here. Okay. And and it's it's just it's been a wonderful uh, uh, facelift, and uh, and it's revitalized it's bigger than that. The spirit of the congregation, and really, the energy of the place is really uh, really uh, sort of thing. But stop in anytime. Check it out. We'd love to show you. Around. Yeah, it's a great spot. It's a great contrast to all the gray. Granite or gray, whatever it is, uh, stuff. And here's this little brick uh, building that we hope is there for a long time. Is the church open all the time so you can come in and look at it? The name of the church is open from sunrise to sunset every day. Uh, otherwise, you'd have to have to buzz your way. The church used to be open 24 hours a day, right. the name. And uh, um, up until about 10 years ago. And then it, things got to be kind of tough. And, uh, and uh, so we had to close it over. Well, you also have your annual fruit, uh, uh, bazaar and fruitcake sale this right. Saturday. That's right. That's right. This, this coming Saturday. Thank you very much. Absolutely. They said that, you know how much fruitcake they make? 2,200 pounds. It goes, it goes all over the place, and I can always tell the days when they're making the hard sauce in the kitchen. <laughs> you hear these bottles clinging, you know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Thanks. Well, I appreciate it, John. Thanks for chatting. Well, I'm going to make thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. You know what? I learned something I never knew before that he taught sixth grade. I spent 30 years doing that. That explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> There's more coffee donuts. I'm sure Father would be more than happy to talk to you. Enjoy yourself. If any of you know where I can get about three more of these ice cream tables, we're starting to get to the point where we could use a few more. So if any of you know where there might be some in attics or barns or basements, we could use about three more ice cream tables out here. And uh, Jane is just reminding me, uh, <laughs> subtle, you know, really, really subtle. Um, these are at your uh, tables, and if you have any other ideas, like I mentioned before, write them down, because we would like to have like, more thoughts on what you'd like to hear about, and uh, you are the people that have more memories about Rochester than I do. I've only been here 30 years, most of you have grown up here, so share with us, because we really appreciate it. Thank you. I believe on the back, we don't have one in